Welcome. It is a rainy Saturday, and y'all decided to come here to celebrate civic engagement. Give yourselves a round of applause. My name is Nye Collymore Henry. I'm the Vice President of Partnerships at the Alliance for Business Leadership. When we were invited to be Hub Week collaborators, we were so excited because we are constantly bringing business leaders together to talk about serious issues, but also have a little bit of fun. So I am so excited to be joined by some awesome, fearless boss ladies, including Tiffany Faison from Sweet Cheeks Q, Tiger Mama, and Fool's Errand, Rika Elise, founder of Beautylink, and Jules Pieri, founder of The Gromit. Please welcome them out. All right. All righty. Hi, guys. Hello. So I just wanted to start by having you introduce yourselves a little bit and say, um, tell us about what you do. Sure, I'll start. Um, hi, I'm Tiffany Faison, uh, chef and owner of Sweet Cheeks Barbecue, Tiger Mama, and Fool's Errand, all in the Fenway. Um, I'm a chef and a business owner. That pretty much sums it up and keeps me busy. Hi, my name is Rika Elise. I am the CEO and founder of Beautylink. Um, I founded the company about three years ago. I'm Boston bred, and uh, I, I am determined to make Boston beautiful yes. somehow. Oh yeah, <laughs> even if it's raining outside. Um, <laughs> and you know, building out a, a startup in the tech space in Boston has been a rewarding thing. Uh, Jules Perry, CEO, co-founder of The Gromit, my third startup. Um, we launch products every day at noon. One you'd want in, at ten, actually, one that you'd love to know about. Some of our golden oldies are um, Soda Stream, Swell Water Bottles, Fitbit, Bananagrams, Otterbox. So what we launched tomorrow could be one of those. Awesome. So this isn't your mama's panel. We're going to be playing a fun game, Cards Against Humanity, but with a lady boss twist. So black cards are going to appear on the screen. Our panelists are going to have 20 seconds to figure out the best answer. And then we're going to use audience participation to gauge who the winner is. So when you hear a card that you like, what are you going to do? OK. That's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. When you hear a card that you like, what are you going to do? Yeah. OK. All righty. So when we you know, sent the email and said that we're going to play a game on stage, what were you thinking? This is going to be fun. Yeah, I think, you know, approaching a panel in a different way and really opening up some humor into a conversation. I did have to me. watch the video you sent. Yeah. But it's Cards Against Humanity. I've never played. Well, this is going to be a first for us all. So, is everybody ready? <laughs> Let the games begin. All righty. If you mansplain that to me one more time, I'll start blank. Oh boy. This is going to be hard. Alrighty. When you're ready, just pass the card to me, and I'm just going to shuffle. Alrighty. Alrighty. So I don't know who gave me this card. If you mansplain that to me one more time, I'll start taking cute selfies. If you mansplain that to me one more time, I'll start a long expletive filled text chain with friends. If you mansplain that to me one more time, I'll start Beyonce. All righty. <laughs> so one more time, audience participation. If you mansplain that to me one more time, I'll start taking cute selfies. If you man explain that to me one more time, I'll start a long expletive text chain with friends. <laughs> if you man explain that to me one more time, I'll start Beyonce. <laughs> okay, so I think it's between Beyonce and the text thread. So, text thread. <laughs> Beyonce. Okay. Who answered Beyonce? It's me, Beyonce always wins. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about the times that people mansplained to you. 
where, how do I begin? Where do I begin? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, a lot of it is, mansplaining is, is something I, I don't think men even understand that they're doing. And, and a lot of times, if I'm giving credit, I think it's good natured. I think it comes from like, no, let me just like explain this so we can be clear, so you can totally understand what I'm saying. Which in the good natured intention of it ultimately is like, an in it's, it's an insult to intelligence and um, women's ability to understand really fucking basic concepts. So, um, <laughs> you know, for me, like, it's interesting, like, you know, Beyonce is a card in there, but what does that mean? You know, I think about what she's done in terms of, you know, she's not someone that like speaks gets in front of a, a microphone and has long political statements or um, she speaks in her work. You know, she's someone that really talks deeply to all of us, especially to women, um, and connects with us in a way that's empowering, that's angry, that there's female rage that's like in, not only allowed but celebrated. Um, so I think there's, instead of, you know, I, can you imagine how often she's been mansplained from when she was oh, yeah. very young in her industry all the way through? And I think we've all dealt with that instead of allowing ourselves to be um, put in a box by that ultimately. Like you just take all that shit and you put it into your work and you come out with something that's greater and more empowered and more intelligent than anyone ever assumed you were. Yeah. So I'd love to hear from you too. As founders, when people mansplain or try to over explain something when you are the boss, this is your concept, um, how do you combat that? What do you do? I actually get more annoyed at um, strangers than in, in a context where I think there might be good intent, where they know me, um, but they think I don't know something. It's more the strangers that get to me, because then there's just a complete set of assumptions and judgments that are happening. Yeah. One, actually, one happened to me just two weeks ago. It wasn't exactly mansplaining, but it falls in the general zip code for me, which was mm -hmm. I was traveling between London and Guernsey, one of the uh, Channel Islands, and I was... Um, they have the system there. I noticed a bunch of men who were um, a bunch of retired golfers, basically, checking their golf clubs. They were a group. And one of them got kind of stuck behind me when I was going through security. And they had this system where it's almost like cues they force you into. And if someone's slow, you can't keep moving. And I was slow because they made me move all my cosmetics into a bag. I hadn't seen that in a long time. I wasn't prepared. And the bag was really cheap, so I was taking forever. I couldn't zip it. And the man behind me said, the golf sweater man said, um, do you, don't you ever travel? Have you never traveled? And I, I, I don't explode much. I don't really take my energy out on strangers. But I, <laughs> I, I chased him down later. Like, I got through it, and then I found him later. And I, he was shorter than me, and I put my face right in his face. And I, I'm sure I spit in his face because I, <laughs> I said, like, you just made a whole lot of assumptions. I'm a CEO. I travel every week. I don't golf for a living. And yes. I, I, could, I couldn't believe it came out of my mouth because I don't really care about strangers that way. But like, I couldn't take it. I was, it was in the middle of the Kavanaugh thing, and I think I was just oh. like on a boiling oh. point. Yeah. And it's like, God. yeah. What about you, Rika? I mean, I have fun with it. So generally, when people start asking me questions, especially men about the beauty space, I tell them I know a lot about their balls because I used to be in prostate <laughs> cancer. So, you know, you know if, if you really want to learn, you could do the research because I had to learn how your balls work. And I know how they work pretty well. Like, you know, it's just, it's just what it is. I, I'm totally fine with it. I, I believe in a, having a sense of humor and translating things into music. So I do a lot of that. So if someone really gets on my nerves, I send them a song or I tell them that I know something really well. I go, OK, cool. Like, I'm not going to explain what a blowout is to you because Google can do that. But I could tell you how your balls work if you need some help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's just pretty much how I go about it. So I tried to pitch this as very PG, but you can't really do Cards Against Humanity with getting a little, without getting a little PG-13. <laughs> <laughs> so We're all adults. I'm glad that's where we are. Have y'all drawn another card? Oh, I forgot that was part of the rules. That's right. All righty, let's start the next card. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I work hard because blank is important. I work hard because blank is important. So I just want to give a round of applause for these ladies because they are working <laughs> on this panel. <laughs> Studying, working, making it work. All righty. Thank you. Are we, the intent is to, okay. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm choosing something. Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. Shuffling, shuffling, shuffling. 
it happen. <laughs> it's not one of these. Okay. I work hard because making a difference is important. I work hard because outperforming the competition is important. I work hard because burning my bra is important. Yes. <laughs> yes. All righty. I work hard because making a difference is important. I work hard because outperforming the competition is important. I work hard because burning my bra is important. Yes! Woo! Woo! Alrighty, I'm, I'm gonna have to redo these, okay. Making a difference. Outperforming the competition. Burning my bra. I think the first one. I think it's making a difference. Yeah. Alrighty, whose answer was that? It's mine, but I'm passing the mic because <laughs> making a difference is burning your damn bra, so no, I did it. Is. burning my bra, yes. okay. it's a very big deal to me, so. Yeah, it is. Yeah, part of like a feminist movement, larger, or? I just, I, I can't wait till the idea about being a founder is being a founder and not being a female founder mm. or a male founder or a black founder or LGBTQ yes. founder. I am a founder. Just define yes. me as that. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to, to just be honest, like burning my bra would be like epic and wonderful because then my gender isn't what you're really looking at. Mm -hmm. It's about what I can do. Oh, yeah. How do you respond? Why do you work hard? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about ultimate freedom, right? Um, and I think burning your bra is a metaphor for like, you don't guys don't want me to burn my bra, I promise you. Um, but it's a metaphor for like what that means in your life to be able to not have things that constrain you, not have things that constrain your gender, not have things that are created for you that you pay way too fucking much for that, that constrain you. So, um, you know, essentially like, Working hard to, for, and also, you know, making a difference was important to me. Like, you give yourself your own platform, and you have to decide what your platform, what your advocacy is, and then be able to move forward from that. So, you know, it's a metaphor for a lot of things, but ultimately it means that I am my own boss, that I decide where we go and how we do it, and in, in what way and with, with what deference to, to whom and who we take along with us. And then also, you know, we talk about it a lot, just being visible and being seen and... I couldn't agree more. It would just be nice to like, you know, even we, even women say like lady boss. I'm a boss, I'm not a lady boss, you know? Yeah. Like, so just to be able to have that straight title and, and to be understood in that way and to just have ultimate freedom. Yeah. So Jules, you are constantly working with businesses that are getting off the ground. So you're working hard for them and they are working hard. Kind of explain how your incubator like- Yeah, it's what Meta, isn't it? Yeah. We're yeah. A, we were a startup and, and yet we, we, ha we help other startups every single day. We've worked with 3,000 small companies. Um, we look at 300 products a week, companies a week, and we launch six. So it's a really um, amazing, awesome group of companies. The products could be any category. And so um, we're meeting them at really ground zero. So when I think about working hard, oh, there's so many things I work hard for. It's actually not myself so much. It's, it's them. I can't mm. let them down. We're very mission driven. I can't let them down. They, they need us so badly because they've been really, really left uh, in the dust by retail. Retail is very consolidated and not so interested in innovation these days, um, including Amazon. And I work also, though, for um, I do work for other women pretty hard. That yeah. really motivates me. And the specifics I'm really talking about would be um, the wall I hit, the, the thing that was super hard for me that had to do with gender. And it's probably the only thing that I'd really talk about when it comes to gender specifically would be um, the venture capital industry is really stuck in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how much of a Don Draper-esque world that was for me in my fundraising. Not in the bad sort of alcohol-fueled behavior, but in the perception of what I could do as a founder and um, my capabilities. So, and it's proven by the stats. stats. Women get 2.7% of venture capital. Not 27, I didn't say 27, I said 2.7. And if those were uh, university admission stats, we'd be marching in the streets because access to capital is access to opportunity. The people who start businesses like us decide who other people get to employ, be employed. And when you have a diverse set of founders, you have a diverse set of opportunities for everybody. And if capital is being narrowed to a very 
I, go, I went to Harvard Business School. 25% of venture capitalists are white guys, venture capitalists are white guys who went to Harvard Business School. So I had lots of advantages in getting in, but I didn't look like them. And I, 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 uh, that I work really hard for, to defy that odd. So while we were backstage, we were talking about staff and the importance of teams and like what you do for your teams. I would love to hear from both of you about how you work hard for your teams every day. I mean, for us, our team is, you know, people say your team is everything. Like, I, it, it is for every company, right? You are 100% driven by the people that work for you and driven by them, driven with them. Um, but we physically need people in our space to make the machine run, right? So um, there's no, like if we're down five servers, you guys feel it. And there's, you know, we can't, we just can't do that. We can't, and we're in a really different labor model right now oh, yeah. in, the, in the world, which is, you know, it has its benefits and it has its, its challenges for us, which is to say um, we have to be really intentional about building a culture that works for our restaurant restaurants. So people need to be able, for me, and this is not just so we retain staff, this is also so people can feel fulfilled. You know, I want everyone to leave feeling um, accomplished at the end of the day, feeling validated, feeling like they didn't have to be anyone but themselves when they leave. No. And so to that, we, we do a lot of things. We make sure that we build a culture of in inclusivity. We make sure that we're checking ourselves and not patting ourselves on the back for building a culture of inclusivity. Because <laughs> when you're doing that, that's when the train comes and goes, oh, yeah. these are all the things you're doing wrong and you don't see it. So you kind of have to be constantly reevaluating. You know, one of the things we also really try to do is with each person that works with us, each team member, we try and figure out why they're, why they're working for us, why they're here. And very rarely it's like, because I think your company is amazing. It's because I want to buy a house or because I want to learn English or I want to do whatever the things may be that, um, that drive people to work. And so we try and um, really employ the, the resources that we are, have access to as a company to make those things happen um, for people that have been with us for a little bit of time. How about you, Rika? I mean, it just depends. I know that I consider every single person that's part of my company part of my team, but focusing a little bit harder on what it means to build out a thoughtful on-demand um, company has been really important to me. So listening to the beauty professionals, understanding their way of life and the mechanics has been very important to me. So I make myself available. It's an open door policy. <laughs> I can speak to a professional in Los Angeles one day or speak to a professional in New Jersey the next day. But the one thing that's really important is to just keep that door open and yeah. listen to their stories and understand how what I'm doing and how I could change things in order to make things um, better for them. Uh, but aside from that, my team that's like behind the scenes that does like the tech and all that, they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> They're crazy because they, they started with me when I had no clue what I was doing, but they've been extremely supportive and sending me great playlists since, so I'm very happy about <laughs> being able to, to be with them. It's about the music. Yeah. Draw one more round of cards. And we're going to go to one last question. How do I maintain my sanity? Good question. Blank and chill. Uh, I... <laughs> oh, God. This is, this is just... <laughs> Can I, like, <laughs> draw all my cards? We never said this was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. I'm going to do some teamwork. You know, teamwork is always necessary. Right? This is, like, having a little bit too... Uh, too much. Uh, this is what collaborative work looks like. <laughs> <laughs> this is just very... Oh, these aren't good. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We play by different rules here. I think... Can um, one more? <laughs> can I get one? Here, take mine. <laughs> There's some good ones in there. there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. I might have to count you down. <laughs> Already, let's count Rika down. 10, 9, oh, come on, guys. 8, 7, 6, 5, okay. 4, okay, okay. Right. 3, 2, 1. <laughs> Give Rika a round of applause. Yeah. Give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 
How do I maintain my sanity? Good question. Smashing the patriarchy and chill. <laughs> How do I maintain my sanity? Good question. Ignoring the haters and chill. How do I maintain my sanity? Good question. Taking charge and chill. Alrighty. Smashing the patriarchy and chill. Woo! Ignoring the haters and chill. Woo! Taking charge and chill. Woo! Okay, taking charge and chill. Who was that? All righty, Jules. You had good ones. Yes. Yeah, I was lucky. I had good ones there. Yeah. So. Uh, taking charge to me probably do, isn't quite as much um, about taking charge of other people or the situation as, as much as it is taking charge of myself. So owning my choices, you know, when things are really crazy, I chose to be a leader of this business. I chose the, the things I do and the things I don't do. But sometimes I have to, like, change my choices. I'll give you an example. This week, the last thing I should have been doing on a busy day was writing a blog post. But I'm somebody who gets a lot of energy from creating, and writing is one of my sole outlets right now. I'm an industrial designer, but... It, can't do that right now. So writing is kind of a proxy for a lot of creativity for me. And I um, had this experience where I spoke at something last week and a, a man came up and asked me the most flat, said the most flattering thing I've ever heard. He told me he wanted to talk about his daughter, not about business, and he wanted to know how to raise her to be like me. Mm. Mm. And it was like, first I was speechless, I was useless. I probed, but I still couldn't come up with anything useful to say to him. I was up half the night trying to think of the answers for him, and, and he wasn't there the next day. I looked for him and had all these answers, all these suggestions. So this blog post, this, these answers became a, a burning need to write a blog post that when I came back into the office, I've been away for a month. I should be working on other things. I had to write that blog post. And so I was taking charge of this explosive thing in me that had to get out. I needed to clean it up, get it out there, so I could focus on everything else I needed to do. And I, I will allow myself those things. It might be a bike ride, it might be a yoga class, it might be working at home for a day, it might be not doing my to-do list, but talking to team members, because I feel like that's what we both need more than me doing something. So taking charge of my own, like, sort of well-being, mental health, and energy is how I do that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. How do you guys maintain your sanity? I twerk. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, music is a very big deal for me, and I twerk in the office. I twerk at home. Well, I twerk in the Uber. I like twerk. <laughs> right. I need to get my energy out, but I also need to remember that the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because it, it leads me to stay passionate. And sometimes I need to be able to move my body and still be passionate. So I know that twerking is not necessarily the best thing, but... Why not? I mean, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that it works for everybody. I mean, currently I'm working out of the Morgan Stanley headquarters in New York, and um, I twerk. So... You have all these people walking down the hallway, <laughs> and I have, like, my beats on, and I'm just, like, I'm taking it in. I'm doing my thing. And they just turn, and they look, and they gauge, and I'm just like, you wish you could have fun at your job. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm having fun at mine, and let me have fun at mine. And so, you know, taking that moment, enjoying music and managing through music, so everybody on my team, in order to speak to me, they have to send me a song. Um, to explain the situation. I love that. So if you have bad news for me, you have to send me a song. If you have good news for me, you have to send me a song. But I need that moment to buffer between the song. You finding the song, sending me the song, and listening to the song gives me about 15 to 20 minutes to actually reflect and understand what I'm about to get myself into versus you just think I'm twerking to it. That's helpful. That's incredible. That is really helpful. Yeah. 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 You know when people say, like, I need to talk to you, and it just, like, goes for a day, it, like, hangs in the air, and you're like, is this good yeah. or bad? Like, <laughs> the song is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm stealing that. I'm adopting that. Um, I don't know. Taking charge, I think um, a lot of what Julie said 
really resonates with me. I think, you know, um, as cooks, you keep your head down and just work insane, crazy hours for years and years and years and years and don't make any money. And, um, you know, I didn't come from a family with means, so there was no, like, backup plan. Was, like, when I didn't have... I showed up a lot on my days off when I had them for, like, staff meals. So it was like, I'm going to eat free food. Um, we have staff meal every day at the restaurants at four for um, the people that are working there. But, you know, I think you work so hard for so long and don't... You just keep this tunnel vision. Um, and I think a lot of people do that be when they're trying to build something for themselves. If you start really looking around you, you can get waylaid and distracted by everything. Um, and so, you know, at the point that I started to understand what we were building and come up for air a little bit, um, it, and I think specifically there a lot of industries, but restaurants have this um, perception that I have to be there all the time, um, not just from the guests, but also from um, the people that work there. And um, it, it's hard, and that's really hard to, like, do all of that and take care of myself. And I think there was a moment for me about a year after we opened Tiger, Tiger Mama, that um, it all sort of came to a head for me. And I was really struggling with depression for the first time. And, you know, and the, out, like, the outward perception is like, everything's great. You're like building all these restaurants and it's mm -hmm. great and we love, and I appreciate all of that. And that, that is also true. I mean, that's the trick, right? All of those things can be true at the same time, but it can also be really difficult. We had a bunch of staffing issues and, um, we had a lot of family stuff going on. It was, just, it, was, it was hard. And so taking charge for me meant finding a way to... I had to be at the restaurant all the time because we were so understaffed. That we physically didn't have people to work the stations we needed them to work. Um, so I had to be working all the time. And then also, how did I take charge of my life at that point when it feels like you can't because you don't have an inch to move? And so I, f I, I decided sleep was a little less important. Mm -hmm. not, I wasn't not sleeping. I just, I needed to get up and move my body. I needed to physically exercise. I needed to find a therapist. I needed to find a business coach. I needed to find a physical trainer. I needed like these people to bring into my life to help me in a way that I had never thought I needed help or, or considered that I did. Um, and I also had to shut down everyone else asking me for things, um, whether it was appearances or charity or campaigning, whatever it was, I had to just stop for a minute and just, and that's very hard. It's exceedingly hard for women to do. And it's hard when you're building something because you feel like you have this momentum that you can't, you can't slow down because you feel like if you take a break or you stutter step or you slow down for a second, it's all going to go away. It all feels like a house of cards. Um, and so it was hard, but I needed to take charge. And, and in that was able to see things more clearly and stop running on a hamster wheel and get off and watch the wheel and see all the things that were broken in the wheel and really start to fix those with our team. So, I don't know. Take charge of myself, I think, same thing. Just like really take a second while still in it and figure out what needed to change. Um, going off of something you said, tell me about how you learn and still learn to say no to things. No for yourself and no to other people and... I got in a fairly small to medium-sized argument with my wife yesterday about that. Um, <laughs> we were talking about it this morning on the way here, and you were like, I thought about canceling today. And I was like, you know, it's like cold in my house and covers, and I have two giant days ahead of me. And she literally like, was like kicking me out of the bed, and like, go do your job. <laughs> um, and no, I was thrilled to come here today. It's not that. Um, yesterday, there was, I don't know, like this is probably more than I should share, but... I had said yes to an event. I'm really overscheduled for the month of November. Not a big deal, but um, I had gotten all this communication from the organizers about, can't, like, it was whatever you'd like to do, we'd like to have you do it and do a demo and show us how to do this thing. And then there were all these subsequent emails of, like, oh, we don't want that, we want this. And can you do this and can you do that? And can you essentially not be yourself? Cook something you don't want to cook. I, I was doing the, the thing for a friend anyway. It wasn't part of my advocacy. Um, and I just said, I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry, you're going to have to find someone else. And it was very hard. And, and there was like a conversation in my family with my wife about, you know, we can't, you're on the invitation, you can't cancel, you can't blah, blah, blah. And then I remind her about the conversation we had after Anthony Bourdain died and after um, Kate Spade died and 
how all of these steps of saying yes all the time and never saying no, it's not like one day you decide that you just can't do it anymore. It's cumulative, right? So if someone's not going to be respectful of what I do and who I am and how I want to do it, the answer is no. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. How about you? I don't feel I can give, I'm, I'm no master of this, I like where I can give amazing advice, but I have a couple of jujitsu tricks, I guess. Yes. Ooh. In, <laughs> in my life, I Do we need to stand up? <laughs> I'm like, yes. can I sit down? <laughs> for me, a lot of um, what I'm asked for is more one-on-one -on -one stuff. It's, I mean, I do get, the, I do have a filter for like, a, you know, talks and things like yeah. this. That um, is one of my tricks, I guess. It's like, who's asking? Like, do I owe them something? Kind of like, is this the person I'd really like to help? And, and then it's some of the basics, like attendance and um, agony factor for me and all that and costs for me. Yeah. But that's kind of straightforward. Um, the, the ones that are harder for me are the people who ask for a one-on-one -on -one type. I can't tell you how many emails. It's probably true for all of you. Because when you're, actually, when you're a female founder, you probably get more of these than men, you know, like, Basically, anybody who sees a young woman who needs anything, they send them to you. Like, if it's at all in your world. And it's really hard to say no in those situations. It can be men too, by the way, it's not all women. Um, and this one thing I learned to do, and it sounds super arrogant and rude, but it really has helped me a lot, which is I will tell people who want to have a meeting with me or a call, and I don't know them, and I don't have a lot of context to know if it's going to be helpful either way is I'll tell them to call me on a weekend. And I don't want that call on a weekend, I, I, I'll be honest. Um, I won't schedule it, because that sounds like work. Um, and I'll call them back if they reach me at a bad time. But I'll, I can't tell you that how many people, more than 50% don't call. Mm. Mm. That's a filter, right? Woo, yeah. I saved yes. that meeting, because yeah. you don't care enough about your own request. And I'll get the Tuesday or the Monday email, oh, I got busy, I'm like, Okay, you had other priorities. You got busy not taking my... care of yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, it sounds awful, but I had to get there because I couldn't filter people just from an email and, and they filter themselves then. It's really helpful. And I will meet with people. If I have a great call, I'll meet with them. I'll continue on with the conversation. It's not like that's a dead, dead end. It's just a great filter. Yeah. I'm just learning how to say no. Um, it took a long time because everybody sees me as a super passionate person. So what they expect is yes all the time. And I just started saying no to mentees recently. I started saying no to events where I might be tokenized a little bit too much. Um, I've said no in the sense of you really need to understand who I am before you decide to ask me to do anything. Right? I'm like, I'm in the beauty and tech space, but you're asking me to come and be at an event for an SMB focused uh, situation. I might not be the best person. Uh, I understand that you may need you know, diversity or something or other, but I don't speak in February. Um, so I made it an active decision to say yes. no to all speaking engagements in February. So I don't wow. speak in public in February for Black History Month. Oh. Um, because I feel like it's inappropriate for you to feel like that's the only time I'm allowed to speak. Yes. Yeah. So, Woo. yes. Um, yeah. it's, my, it's my number one month for no's. Yes. Good. It's February. <laughs> like, I think it should just be called no month. <laughs> like, I just say no. Oh, my gosh. Can I have one thing to that? And I, this is something that took me a really long time to figure out because I think women don't want to... I think we don't want to spend money, especially when you're in a startup, right? You want to like make sure that you're it's sustainable long term, that you're not spending money in the wrong ways. And it took me really long time to get this. Um, and it doesn't have to be a full time person, but if you can hire someone that can just answer emails for you like five hours a week, and the stuff that like comes in, you send to that person, and they become a filter for you and an assistant. And um, and if it it's a no, it's not coming straight from you, and it's just easier to do, and it also. Um, forces people to understand that they're um, that you're accessible, but there are also boundaries to, that are um, you taking care of yourself that people can't just immediately access you for that time that they were running the marathon in Hawaii for their <laughs> sister's brother's cousin's friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not that that's not totally valid. No, ver yes. yeah, very. So we have about a minute and a half left, and I'm very sad to end our game, but. I just kind of want to go around and being a founder, being a boss, 
Thank you for calling me out because I've been saying lady boss and I don't like that either. Right. <laughs> Just boss. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to people who are thinking about founding something and are just need that extra push? Well, it's the advice I gave you backstage. You have a decision, maybe, right? We all have decisions, and some of them are about founding companies. And I've learned to um, do something. I've heard of it called the regret avoidance algorithm. Essentially, that's what Jeff Bezos calls it. Um, I've learned that I rarely regret something I did, but I can regret the things I didn't do. So I tend to over-bias for the thing that makes me um, queasy, scared. In my case, I feel it in my stomach when I'm scared of something, when I know it's an edge, when it's something that's harder than the alternative. It's usually, the growth thing is usually harder than the alternative, or the unconventional thing's harder than the alternative, and I feel it in my stomach. And when I feel it in my stomach, I know it's a good thing. Like, I've learned to recognize that queasy stomach as my friend. So that's my advice if you're thinking about starting a company. If you think, like, I think the worst advice in the world is if it feels good, you'll know it. I'm like, that's the opposite of the truth. <laughs> like, it's the total opposite. So if you want to start a company that feels horrible, that's probably what everybody else felt too. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's so true. Like, it, it's, um, it feels... I think especially for women, like there's this idea that you get to this place and everything feels great, right? Like there's this like gold seal and everything's fine, you feel great. Um, and there, it's important to take moments to understand what you've done and where you're at and how good it, it does feel in some ways. And that for me has to be like compartmentalized so I'm not co also thinking about my list of things I need to get done. Um, but yeah, I mean, if for me, I think it's figure out what you wanna do, make sure it's the only thing that you wanna do in that space for that time and find someone who's done it or whose life looks like what you want it, yours to look like, and then do all of the legwork leading up to it, right? Um, because it's very hard once you push and do the thing, once you launch yourself, to um, crawl back if you weren't ready. On the other side, women are always the worst arbiters of thinking they're never ready. So it's hard to know when that time is. So when people say, chase your dreams, I will always say, like, work your ass off for your dreams. Yeah. Like I always tell the people, because I think when I first started my company, everybody told me it wasn't going to actually like lift off the ground. And I had to learn the difference between advice and opinions mm. 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 and how, you know, you're going to you're going to waste your time if you're running and taking everybody's opinion mm -hmm. as being your advice. And you need to be able to make a difference between those two things to really push forward and build your company the way you want to build your company. You are not put on this earth to be like anybody else but yourself. Um, so, you know, it's one of those big main things. And something that I guess I, I need to push forward with a little bit further is that I'm just mentioning this just because it's random, but I have a very ethnic name don't be afraid of using it in public. I don't really use mine in public because my mom doesn't call it me anymore, but my name's Majus Arika, and it tends to be a fear factor sometimes because you feel like you're not going to be able to reach the top because you're different. Mm. You will reach the top because you are different. Mm. So, like, you know, be okay with it, be authentic, but know the difference between advice and opinions, and you're going to kill advice. it. It's great advice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Give a round of applause for Jules, Rika, and Tiffany. And for Nye. All righty. Enjoy the rest of Hub Week. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you.